Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Rice Restoration and the Criminalization of Voting. I'm Manal Haddad, Senior Communications Manager for Campaign Legal Center, uh, and wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process, and we believe our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Over 5 million Americans are currently silenced in our democracy because of a past felony conviction. This level of disenfranchisement is a product of legislation enacted during the post-reconstruction period, which intentionally sought to strip Black Americans of their newfound freedom. Today, these laws continue to disproportionately impact Black and Brown voters. The rights restoration process is confusing, it varies by state, and it is often burdensome. Beyond the 5 million Americans who cannot vote because of a past felony conviction, there are as many as 19 million Americans with felony convictions who can vote but may not know it because of rampant dis misinformation and poor administration. It is crucial that we continue advancing critical rights restoration work, especially ahead of the 2024 presidential election, to ensure that all Americans who have the right to vote have the means and knowledge to exercise it. Now, I want to turn it over to our moderator for today, national reporter covering voting rights for The Guardian, Sam Levine. Thanks, Manal. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Levine. I'm a reporter at The Guardian covering voting rights in the U.S. Uh, just before we started our discussion, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit those questions. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session for everyone. Um, we'll do our best to get to each question, but we might not be able to get to everyone's question if we run out of time. So if you have follow-up questions, um, you can send an email to Campaign Legal Center. Um, if you're a member of the press, email media at campaignlegalcenter.org. And if you're a member of the public, you can email info at campaignlegalcenter.org. Now, really thrilled to introduce today's panel. Uh, Blair Bowie is the director of Campaign Legal Center's Restore Your Vote project, which focuses on ending felony disenfranchisement by democratizing access to rights restoration services and working with directly impacted communities to dismantle systemic barriers to the ballot box through advocacy, litigation, and policy change. Next, I'm thrilled to welcome Dawn. Dawn Harrington is the executive director of Free Hearts, an organization led by formerly incarcerated women that provide support, education, and advocacy in organizing families impacted by incarceration. Dawn is also the Director of Special Projects for the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Welcome, Dawn. Ray De La Cabada is co-chair of the Criminalization of Voting Committee at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. He served on the board of directors from 2012 through 2018 and is part of the White Collar Crime Committee, where he's worked on sentencing recommendations sent to the Sentencing Commission. Really thrilled to have everyone join us today to discuss these critical issues around rights restoration. To start off, I wanted to pose a question to Blair, and that is, you know, the justice system we know has a disproportionate effect on Black and Brown Americans. And could you talk a little bit about how that intersects with the national landscape around voting rights and restoration, what we're seeing today? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I think that it's always important to start any discussion of felony disenfranchisement by looking at the history of why we have these laws. Um, America is a huge outlier on the national landscape or on the international landscape. Um, we're one of only a handful of democracies uh, that disenfranchises people who are not incarcerated. Um, and that group of countries that do uh, disenfranchise people during incarceration is also small and dwindling. Um, so we have to ask the question, why do we have these laws? Why do we disenfranchise nearly 5 million Americans? Um, and the reason really comes from our history. Uh, as Manal mentioned, uh, we started seeing felony disenfranchisement laws proliferate around the South in the post-Reconstruction period. Um, so after the Civil War, the Southern states had to pass new constitutional constitutions to conform with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, and there was a brief period where Black folks in the South actually gained a lot of political power after the Civil War. Um, when the federal forces started to withdraw, 
a lot of states went ahead and passed new constitutions. Um, and there were a few decades where extra legal violence and voter suppression became a very common way of sort of retaking those state legislatures. Um, and and, and, and uh, this was an open attempt to reclaim the political structures that had existed before the Civil War. Um, so around the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, these Southern states started passing new constitutions and they brought together all white constitutional conventions and went about this with the explicit purpose of trying to reinstate the political system of white supremacy that had existed before the Civil War. Uh, and the framers of those constitutions found that by expanding the criminal legal system to target black people and adding felony disenfranchisement and expanding the scope of felony disenfranchisement, they could expediently accomplish their goals of disenfranchising black communities. Uh, they said this openly on the record when they passed these constitutions. Um, and in many ways, these uh, constitutions still are, these, these laws still operate that way. Um, we see disproportionate impacts on communities of color with this disenfranchisement. Um, and I think in the context of the conversation that we're talking about today, it's really important to also think about that period um, during Reconstruction before these new constitutions were in place where uh, there was a huge rise in extra legal violence, the rise of the KKK, these sort of um, uh, very violent ways of keeping people away from the ballot box. That was kind of encoded when the states passed their new constitutions late in the, late in the 19th century, early in the 20th century. Um, and instead of doing extra legal violence, they turned that into uh, using the legal system itself to suppress the right to vote. So they legalized and put into law that voter suppression. Um, and that was done through felony disenfranchisement and through uh, all kinds of other Jim Crow laws, literacy tests, et cetera. Felony disenfranchisement is the only one of those laws that is still explicitly on the books. Um, but it's important to connect back to that history when we're talking about, you know, you see videos of people being arrested at gunpoint for having voted when they weren't eligible. Um, this is all just a long thread of history of using the legal system to intimidate and suppress voters. And Blair, just Manal mentioned it in her opening remarks, but could you just remind us how many people today are disenfranchised because of a felony conviction and what percentage of those people are post sentence? So what, you know, have completed their criminal sentence and still are barred from voting? I think the most recent estimate is about 4.6 million are um, disenfranchised under law. So actually don't have the right to vote. Um, but there are over 24 million Americans who have passed felony convictions. And a lot of those people, even though they have the right to vote under law, don't know that. And that's because we have such a patchwork of different laws across the country. And that is uh, exacerbated by the use of the legal system to scare people um, into thinking that if they try to vote when they're not eligible, that the consequences will be disastrous. It's basically saying to people, it's not even worth it to try. Um, so that kind of de facto disenfranchisement, we, we say that that's about probably 19 million people may be de facto disenfranchised by that misinformation and intimidation, while there are about 4.6 million people who are disenfranchised under law. Um, and I think it's around 80% of those people I'll have to check and get back to you on the, the number of those folks that are post sentence because that's actually shrunk quite a bit as laws have um, changed in states across the country. And we, we passed a tipping point earlier this year where now um, the majority of states do not disenfranchise people um, after their sentence. So I'll, I'll look that up and tell you later. And Ray, what, Ray one place where we've seen uh, a tremendous amount of attention around disenfranchisement and, and people being prosecuted for 
voting when they're ineligible is Florida. There's a state agency there called the Office of Election Crimes and Security that's made a lot of headlines for aggressively going after people with past criminal convictions um, and bringing charges against them. Can you walk us through sort of what happened there and what's going on with those cases? Hi, welcome and thank you for, for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to follow on Blair's point, uh, as we talk about what's happening in Florida, I mean, Amendment 4, um, uh, where, where a state we overwhelmingly said we wanted uh, people to start voting again after they completed their sentences. Then we had to come up with the technicality. Well, sentences include court costs, which, of course, impact uh, those who don't have the money to pay the court costs, right? So uh, I liken that, if we're going to take a historical perspective, court costs is the new poll tax, right? If you look historically at, at, at impediments to allow uh, minority people to vote. Uh, what's, what, what happened, what's happened here in, in Florida is um, through the governor, uh, he is he has uh, created this 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 uh, agency that uses other outside law enforcement agencies. They themselves don't have police officers, so they have to rely on on local law enforcement agencies or the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And they did a roundup uh, and arrested approximately twenty or so people uh, around the state. Uh, South Florida, Hillsboro, and some people in the panhandle. Uh, those cases were being handled by what's called the statewide prosecutor, which is supervised by Ashley Moody, who's the state attorney general, and has basically been following suit on everything the governor wants. She's been defending all of his, she's the one that goes to court and, and defends things when they're deemed unconstitutional that are being challenged. Um, and she is prosecuting this on his behalf. There are some uh, some small amount of cases that are being prosecuted by local, what's called state attorneys in Florida. They're the equivalent of a district attorney. Uh, and but most of the local state attorneys are declining these type of cases. They're not they're not proceeding with them. Uh, whereas under Ashley Moody, there's a directive from the governor's office. Um, to, to move forward on these cases. And what's happened is they immediately got challenged on, on jurisdictional grounds. Uh, and uh, two or three judges, two, two in Dade County in Miami and one in, in Hillsborough agreed that they didn't have jurisdiction and went ahead and dismissed on those grounds. Governor DeSantis then uh, went to the legislature and amended the law to, to allow the Office of Statewide Prosecution to have jurisdiction. In other words, OK, well, you're saying legally we can't do this. I'm going to change the law to allow us to prosecute through this office. And the reason he wants to do this is because he can control the prosecution when it's Ashley Moody. He can't really go after 20 different state attorneys and convince them to go forward on these cases because on their face, they're pretty ridiculous cases. Um, they're, they're not the cases that entice a prosecutor uh, to go after a bad person, a criminal, you're, you're, you're really just, um, you're not stopping anything here. You're not, um, policing anything of worth here. You're being a bully with these type of cases, in my opinion. So, uh, where we stand now is they filed appeals on the cases that have been dismissed. Other cases are still pending. As uh, we noted before we came on, uh, you're, you're tracking these better than I am. Uh, the one in Gainesville, it looks like it's going to be going. Uh, and one case went to trial in Tampa, Hillsborough County, uh, a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Hart. Uh, and essentially, the jury split the baby on that. Uh, there's two types of cases, two types of charges that they prosecute. It's the actual act of voting fraudulently, going to the, to the polls and voting. And then what you do in the application process and what you swear to. Um, so in that case, they found them not guilty of the voting, but they found them guilty of what he put in the form. And that really is one question. The one question is, have you had rights restored? Uh, and if you put, yeah, they're saying that you're, you're being fraudulent, you're lying. But that's where we're going to talk about today. The confusion stems from a lot of these people, based on all the law changes, thought they could vote. 
in a lot of instances, they were solicited, they were approached, they were told, look, let's get you a, an application, let's get you going. So the idea that this is somehow criminal, that they meant to deceive someone is rather ludicrous. And like you mentioned, Ray, I've been following this in my own reporting. And you know, one critical part of the context of these prosecutions is, you know, it's not only that these people were arrested, you know, the day that they were charged and arrested, the governor held a press conference at a in a courthouse in Fort Lauderdale, surrounded by uniformed law enforcement officers and said, you know, these people are going to pay the price for for what they've done. Uh, we at The Guardian and other outlets in Florida have published videos of many of the people being arrested by agents. We published a video of a man in Miami who was arrested by law enforcement agents who surrounded his house um, with long guns and had them aimed at him when they arrested him for this voter fraud. And I'm curious, you know, is there an element of intimidation here? What kind of uh, effect do you think that has when you have the governor come out and you know, make a press conference, when you have law enforcement acting in this way on people who might have a past uh, criminal conviction and might be wondering if they are eligible to vote? Sam, I mean, I, I think you've really hit, hit it on the head there as far as why this is happening. I think this is all about intimidation. I think this is all about voter suppression, uh, 100%. Uh, because, and, and why why do I say that? Why do I have that opinion? Well, part of what I've been doing uh, on behalf of NACDL is fielding calls from people that are scared, people that are afraid they're going to be next. And they voted, but they had a criminal history. Am I going to go to jail? I, I This isn't worth it. Um, and I fielded multiple, multiple calls of that nature. Uh, so, him getting up there and doing a, a press conference with the word integrity in the podium, I, I recall it well, is what really pissed me off to the point where, where I got involved. Uh, the idea that you're somehow upholding the law when what you're doing is being a bully and intimidating people, that frankly, they served their sentence. If anything, why don't we applaud them for wanting to reintegrate themselves into society and have a voice? Instead of being bitter at the world, they, they came out and they want to be a part of the process. And what we do is we stymie them. Uh, it is uh, the bullying tactics of all bullying tactics that I've seen in recent memory. And it, it all goes to the same type of person, people of color, people with no, with no money. Uh, and then you jam them up with court costs so that they'll never become eligible. And then you scare anyone that's thinking of potentially voting or going to see someone at an organization like Blair's or Dawn's and now Don is trying to talk them into, listen, we're going to help you through this. Let's get you, let's get you registered. And they don't, they don't ever want to even deal. Why? Why? I'm going to get arrested for voting. Um, and so it's not an unreasonable, irrational thought on the part of these people. I've talked to them. Um, they're also going a step further and, and going after nonprofit agencies that are enlisting people. Uh, and, and you're hearing things from law enforcement, like what's the party affiliation? Well, if someone in this chat wants to tell me what the relevance in a criminal investigation is of whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, that, that is no indicia of criminal activity whatsoever. So what we have is obviously they're focusing on nonprofit organizations that go after a specific type of vote. Uh, and they're showing up without subpoenas without warrants and asking for information about canvassers. So now you're trying to intimidate canvassers. Um, you're trying to intimidate agencies who are doing nothing but just beautiful work to try to get people out and vote. So absolutely the, the effect of this is to try to have a chilling effect on an entire sector of the population that may statistically vote a certain way. I will tell you that Hart was, was someone to, to, to Blair's point and, and the announcement that we did at the beginning, this isn't a political thing. That, that gentleman voted Republican and he was a, a, a supporter of Trump. So this idea that this affects everyone, everybody's ability to vote. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the point of this is, listen, if, if you got a record, don't even think of voting because you're going to get arrested. 
I want to turn to Dawn. Dawn, you're based in Tennessee, which has one of the highest disenfranchisement rates in the country. It's particularly high for Black Tennesseans. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the law there and the efforts of you and Free Hearts to change uh, the law. Yes, definitely. So um, actually, uh, Tennessee has the number one impact uh, currently um, of felony disenfranchisement on Black and Latino voters. And um, our law is really one of the most convoluted laws of any state. Um, we are a state that requires a certificate of restoration, which um, is basically a form that has to be filled out um, by the court clerk and, and by probation. And um, we're one of only a few states that requires um, the payment of criminal legal obligations, uh, specifically court costs and restitution. Um, we're the only state that connects the payment of um, child support um, to being uh, re-enfranchised. And so um, it's definitely extremely um, difficult intentionally. Um, there's different pathways based on when your conviction was, um, whether it was before 1973, um, and then there was a period between 1973 and 1981 where no one lost their right um, to vote due to a felony conviction. And then after 1981, um, it was reinstated and has continued to expand actually. And so, um, and, and also we're one of only a few states that permanently disenfranchise anyone. And so we've been working uh, for about four years to change that law. Um, and uh, some of what we've done, um, we've introduced legislation, um, which this year we got a whole lot further on. However, um, we were not able to actually move it uh, due to the political environment in our state. But we are definitely looking forward to um trying to bring it back next year, which is the second year in this session around automatic voting restoration. Um, we've also been, you know, working uh, with our, well, trying to encourage our governor um, um, to set a precedent by doing an executive order, such as we've seen in Iowa and other states. And so we've been, you know, continuing the conversation with that and getting constituents involved in, um, seeking that change through an executive strategy. And even though we know that, you know, the following governor could undo that um, executive order, this could really set a precedent, um, set clarity from the top um, and advise the legislature to do the right thing when it comes to um, uh, felony disenfranchisement and voting restoration. And um, lastly, we've uh, been working with Campaign Legal Center and Equal Justice Under the Law, Baker Donaldson, um, and NAACP is an um, organizational plaintiff to challenge the process um, of voting restoration in our state. So we're working on this from several different angles, and um, you know we're not going to stop until our, we can free the vote here. And just to put a point on what Don was saying, you know I've reported on Tennessee's process for restoring voting rights. And, you know, basically, I think there's three different sets of rules depending on when you were convicted and the type of conviction you have. So, you know, even just I encourage everyone to look on the Secretary of State's website at the, the instructions they have for figuring out if you can restore your voting rights. And it's extremely, extremely difficult to figure out what the rules are. And Dawn, just very quickly, you know, Blair talked about the sort of longstanding roots of these policies and, you know, that these are disenfranchisement laws have been around for a long time. I'm curious if you feel like there's more momentum to change them now, if there's more attention 
on these policies now that there than there has been in the past? And if so, you know, why do you think there has been that change? Yes, I do think that there is more momentum. Um, there is more uh, movement. Uh, part of it is, you know, just the work and the organizing that has happened across the entire state to raise awareness about this um, and also to, you know, help people restore their voting rights because we've run into several people that could have, you know, registered to vote, but because of all of the intentional misinformation and even misinformation that people receive from um, clerks, offices and probation, etc., cetera, um, has basically prevented them from trying to register to vote because, you know, they thought the wrong thing. They thought that they couldn't register. They thought that they, um, they thought they were convicted during that period when we had no felony disenfranchisement, but they still, you know, didn't believe that they could easily restore their right to vote. Or some people we've ran into thought that, um, thought that just because they had a felony, they can never vote. And so um, I think what has happened is just um, the movement and um, organization and the organizing of really just raising the awareness about, you know, what our law is here and, um, and, and basically that it needs to change. And so there definitely is uh, more of a momentum. And I think um, in addition to that, the, the Pamela Moses case um, helped to really highlight um, felony disenfranchisement and criminalization in our state. So, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Pamela Moses case and you know the, the impact that you think it's had there on rights restoration? For anyone who doesn't know, Pamela Moses was a woman who was uh, prosecuted for, for trying to register to vote while she was ineligible. She was sentenced to five years in prison for doing so, and her conviction was overturned because the uh, prosecutor didn't turn over um, all of the relevant evidence to her defense. And, you know, in order to get to that point, I covered this case very closely. You know, Pamela Moses actually turned down, you know, a quite lenient um, plea deal that I think, you know, that would have resulted in no prison time. She could have walked away from the case sort of got free and she refused to do so. And, you know, she refused to take that deal. And I think a lot of people in her position, you know, might just take the deal to get it over with. And I'm curious, you know, what kind of impact do you think it's had seeing someone fight that kind of prosecution and ultimately be successful? Yeah, I think it, it was um, very powerful to see. Um, at first, I think it had an opposite effect of where, you know, the to show that she was criminalized and um, and ultimately given a state prison sentence um, in order uh, for voting. I think we had we heard people say, you know, I don't want to get done like that, and I think that was the intention. Um, but ultimately, you know, for her to fight it, for it to um, be able to uh, be such a public um, showing and such a public outrage. Um, ultimately, what happened is, like you said, it was overturned, as well as the judge um, on her case, the district attorney on her case were both voted out, and the line DA was fired. And so um, I think now it had a positive impact to see what our impact was ultimately. But I think you know, originally um, it did have the intended consequence of, you know, people saying that, you know, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't know exactly. And I don't want to do this because I don't want to end up like Pamela Moses. And turning back to Blair, before we open up the, quest the floor for questions, I just want to ask you one thing we've talked about, you and I, Blair, is this idea of who bears the responsibility for knowing their ineligibility when the rules are confusing? And could you talk a little bit about how you see states shifting that burden or, or the difference in approaches to who bears that burden? Yeah, definitely. I think 
you know, one of the main problems that we've been talking about is that these laws are confusing. Often they're intentionally designed to be confusing. Um, policies are changing all the time. Um, in Florida, the law changed about eight times over the course of two years from Amendment 4 to SB 7066 to various um, injunctions. Um, and this, this happens all the time in other states. It doesn't even have to be a law change. Um, for example, in Virginia, the governor has just summarily reversed years of a policy of automatically restoring voting rights through executive clemency um, to people once they've completed their sentence. All of that creates a lot of confusion and creates a lot of de facto disenfranchisement broadly in the population. Um, but then if you take it down and sort of look at what that does on an individual level, uh, that's where things get really scary and can lead to prosecutions. And that's sort of part of part and parcel of what this is all about. Um, as Ray said, it's it's naked voter suppression. Um, the pretext doesn't hold up because voter fraud is a vanishingly small problem and study after study shows that. But I think the main point is that if the states really cared about, you know, were concerned that pe people voting when they're ineligible is going to threaten the results of elections or the integrity of elections, the obvious thing to do is to verify people's eligibility when they register to vote and to regularly check through the voter rolls with the criminal records that they have easy access to and determine whether or not people are eligible. But states have totally shirked that responsibility all across the country. And it's important to know that federal law requires that states do this, um, but that law is not being followed. Um, so you have a situation where the laws are complicated, often intentionally so, there's no real help being offered by the states to help people figure out their eligibility. You get these problems where the, the registration forms, the instructions are super vague. Like Ray said, Florida's form basically requires you to already know what the law is and then draw a legal conclusion about whether or not you've had your rights restored. It's not grounded in knowable facts. For example, some states like I think Idaho's form just says, I'm certifying that I'm not currently in prison for a felony conviction. People usually know if they're in prison for a felony conviction. But Florida is saying, I certify that my civil rights have been restored. Who knows what that means? You have to be a lawyer to know what that means, or you have to have someone helping you. And then you've got the problem of the people being helped, being prosecuted or investigated separately. Um, so they're not setting up people for success when they're trying to register and understand their own eligibility. And then you've got a total abdication of the responsibility to verify people's eligibility. So in Florida, throughout all of these court cases, the Secretary of State's office was swearing up and down to the federal judiciary that they were gonna check every single voter registration and make sure that people met these complicated eligibility criteria that they had imposed. They did not do that. Instead, they've turned around and prosecuted those people. It's like laying a trap. The other way this shows up is you get states that similarly like Florida could be and have a responsibility under federal law to coordinate um, the records from the various parts of the criminal legal system with the election agencies so that the election officials can look at those records and verify whether or not people are eligible. In other states, um, rather than doing that, they will just note that somebody has a felony conviction and automatically assume they're not eligible, even if people's voting rights are automatically restored in that state. And this is the other side of the coin. They put they then put the burden on those people to prove that they're eligible, even when, again, they could just they have this information on hand. They can just tell you themselves. Um, so some states create additional paperwork requirements for people to have to, you know, bring in a certificate that proves that they're eligible. We've just brought a lawsuit about this last week in Louisiana, where people have their voting rights restored automatically um, once they've been released from prison or parole, or if they've been on parole for five years. And in fact, many people never even lost the right to vote if they were never sent to prison. But anyone who has this sort of felony flag on their voter record, they're making bring in this documentary proof of eligibility even though they actually have these systems already coordinated and can see who's eligible and who's not. 
that's another layer of voter suppression, making people go back and get more documentation. That just means that people are going to drop off. They're not going to be able to do that. They don't have time. They don't have the resources. They're, the officials aren't giving it to them. Um, so that's how we see this play on both sides. It works always in the state's favor. It always creates voter suppression. Um, and the burden always falls on to the individual. And when there's a mistake, they pay the price. Either they're wrongly denied the right to vote or they're prosecuted for having voted when they weren't eligible. And really the solution is that uh, states need to start following federal law. You know, a lot of groups are working on enforcing this. I just talked about our lawsuit. The Brennan Center recently brought a lawsuit about the instructions on Florida's form. But ultimately, we need the Justice Department to step in and enforce these laws. And just quickly, Blair, before we open it up to questions, you know, what resources are out there now for people who are trying to navigate this process, who are interested in voting but are unsure about their status and if they're eligible? Where can they turn? There are lots of great resources. Um, we have one, restoreyourvote.org, at the Campaign Legal Center. That's our website where folks can go on and find out, regardless of what state they live in, um, whether or not they're eligible to vote after a felony conviction, and if not, how they can restore their voting rights. There are amazing groups in almost every state, like Free Hearts, that can provide that in-person assistance, which is so important, especially in Tennessee, where getting your voting rights restored takes a lot of effort and a lot of advocacy. Um, and then, of course, we mentioned for, for folks who find themselves in the really unfortunate situation of being prosecuted for good faith mistakes, NACDL is a great place to reach out to um, and is creating the resources that defense lawyers need to be able to, to advocate for, for those folks. And with that, I think we're going to take questions. If you haven't submitted them already, um, submit them now. And I don't know if we have some queued up, but we can start to take them. Um, Carolyn asks, um, can we discuss parole and probation as it relates to dis disenfranchisement? So I think, you know, in various states, the rules vary. In some states, you know, you can vote if you're on parole, other states you can't, some states you can vote if you're on probation, other states you can't. The rules around what exactly is probation is even up for, for dispute in places like Texas. Um, I don't know, Blair, do you wanna sort of walk through probation and parole as, as it relates to disenfranchisement? I think that's, that's a good summary. Um... And I would say, check out Restore Your Vote to see how, how it affects the right to vote in individual states. Um, and I, say, I said this earlier, but I don't think I said it very clearly. And a, a really exciting point in this movement has recently passed where um, now the majority of states do not disenfranchise people after they are out of prison. So the 26th state there was New Mexico changing its law. Um, such that it doesn't disenfranchise people after they've left prison. So that's an enormous tipping point in this movement. Um, but uh, to, to your earlier question, Sam, uh, three quarters of people who are disenfranchised are living in their communities. So my name is Jahara Bahar. So the states that do still do this are, are, um, are disenfranchising people who are on probation and parole, largely speaking. And Sam, I, I would add, for, for at least in Florida, which is really the, the area that I know, probation, if you're not completed with probation, that's still a part of your sentence. So technically, you haven't completed your sentence uh, because you could be in violation of your probation. So it's not formally over yet. So in a place like Florida, you wouldn't be eligible to vote until you complete successfully. I'll just add one thing quickly to that is, you know, I think one thing I've learned just in reporting this is that you know, for someone outside of the criminal legal system, you think like, how could someone not know if they're done with their sentence or not? Like, it seems like a pretty definitive thing. And my understanding is, is that actually in the, in the criminal legal system, it can be sort of difficult to figure that out. You know, one piece of paper some in one place might say one thing, something else might say another thing. And when someone's on probation, you know, that might just mean 
you know, that they never check in with a, a corrections official. They might check in once a year, once a month. You know, it's not always that if you're sort of in these post-release situations that, you know, being a part of the criminal system is still a major part of your life. So, you know, oftentimes what you see in these cases is it's people who might be on probation or parole, but are sort of living normal lives and they're getting kind of pulled back into the criminal system because they've made this. Um, yeah, Sam, that's an excellent point. And, and you're absolutely 100% correct. It is confusing to understand when your case ends. Uh, a lot of times I have a conversation with clients where I'm trying to explain to them why the case has not ended yet, right? And I, I liken it, the analogy I give them sometimes, it's kind of like, uh, the, you know, you, you know, an octopus, you know, grabs you, there's multiple technicals. You think you're finally released and you realize one of them still has you by the ankles, right? Uh, there was a court cost you needed to pay over here, a reinstatement fee you needed to pay over there. And 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 these people just want to get back to their lives. Uh, they, they, they have lawyers for a reason to help guide through that process. And it's a complicated process that as both these, these fine ladies have uh, attested to, gets more complicated on purpose. If really the point of this is to ferret out fraud, why not simplify eligibility so you can clarify where the misrepresentation of fraud is? That's not what they're doing. They're convoluting it more to confuse people to not bother to check if they're eligible. Uh, so it's a brilliant strategy to suppress vote is what it is. But to, I, I digress, but to, to your point, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very difficult to understand when a criminal case ends unless you do this every day like I have for 32 years. I think we'll move to the next question. Um, I don't know if we have it queued up. Um, how many states have their disenfranchisement laws embedded in the state constitution, as is true um, in Alaska? Um, Blair, I don't know if you want to tackle that. Yeah, and I'll invite Dawn to jump in as well, since we've been looking at cross comparing Tennessee's constitution with a lot of different states. Um, every state ha that that disenfranchises people has gets that authority from the state constitution. So they all have that at some level. Some state constitutions mandate disenfranchisement. Um, so, for example, Washington state's constitution says um, that people lose the right to vote for convictions of infamous crimes until they're restored to civil rights. So there's a mandate there. On the other hand, Tennessee's constitution says that the legislature has the power to disenfranchise for infamous crimes, but by itself, the constitution doesn't disenfranchise people. The other main difference I'd point out between all the constitutions is that um, most state constitutions allow for the legislature to create pathways to voting rights restoration. Um, so for example, again, going back to, to Washington, that says it does mandate disenfranchisement, but it also provides that people can get their civil rights restored. And then the legislature is free to say what that means when. Tennessee, similarly, because the Constitution says you can disenfranchise, but you don't have to, it's implied that the legislature also has the power to re-enfranchise and reinstate the right to vote. There are three states that do not have any sort of ability for the legislature to, by legislation, create pathways to voting rights restoration. Those are Iowa, Kentucky, and Virginia, which I see a lot of questions about Virginia. Um, so in those states, it, the Constitution just says you're disenfranchised for a felony, and then that's it. And so the implication is that the only way to get your voting rights back is through executive clemency. The governor has to restore voting rights. So we've seen in all three of those states in the last five years, uh, the governors have taken executive action to re-enfranchise people at a systemic level. Um, now we're seeing the governor in Virginia roll that back and say, I'm not doing that anymore. Everyone has to apply individually. And I'm not going to tell you what my new criteria are. I'm just going to assess it on a case by case basis. Um, so that's those are the main differences in in the state's constitutions. But all authority to disenfranchise people stems from the state's constitutions. 
I also saw a question that I'll tack on to this about um, whether it would be better to have a federal law rather than leaving it up to the state's constitutions when um, to the state law when people can get their voting rights restored. Um, I think that certainly we want federal law to set uh, the boundaries for how long people can be disenfranchised. A federal law that gets rid of felony disenfranchisement is ideal, but there have been recent proposals like in the Democracy for the People Act that would say, you know, you can't disenfranchise people beyond the time that they're incarcerated. Um, and that's a great step in the right direction because it allows space for states to not disenfranchise, um, but it also sets the maximum outer bounds of how long someone can be denied the right to vote. John, is there anything you want you to add to that and you know, what it says in Tennessee's constitution about disenfranchisement? Um, yes. So, um, well, I'll just add this that because um, I think Blair answered that part really well. I think, you know, one of the things to to bring up is that you know, with the different states. So for example, in my situation, I was um, incarcerated and convicted in New York where my rights would have been automatically restored. However, um, because I live in Tennessee, I had to get, still get um, New York to fill out my certificate of restoration form. And that was incredibly difficult. It actually took me nine years to get um, my voting rights back altogether. And, you know, part of it is which they didn't have that process. And so really no one was willing to fill out my form um, until it became a national news story. But then there are so many other people that have um, convictions in other states that um, still are up against this trying to get the form filled out by authorities that are in that other state. And um, another thing that I'll quickly mention is um, regarding Iowa, which is, um, which Blair has mentioned is one of the states where, where the constitution does say, um, does, you know, basically make the governor's office puts the onus on them to restore voting rights and they are one of the um they are one of the um executive orders that we've been really looking at it as a model and when we spoke with um the governor's council and along with our governor's council you know it was very important for them to they they are trying to seek a constitutional amendment and part of the executive order was they knew that the constitutional amendment will take a long time. And so um, those, those are my additions, but I think Blair did a great job. I think we'll move on to the next question. I think we have time for one or two more. I don't know if we have one queued up. How is the Department of Justice not being held accountable for allowing unconstitutional laws to continue to be passed? Um, I don't know, is there anyone who wants to jump in and tackle that one? Well, uh, well, uh, I mean, that that's a tall order because, you know, every state has the inherent authority to create its own laws. They don't, they're not violation, not violation of federal law. And the federal law just punts, as Blair pointed out, basically punts its responsibility to the states to to do right by the situation. Um, so, you know, I think it's a valid question. Um, but the, the thing about it is, is to me, at least in Florida, it's the application of the law that's more problematic than the law itself. It's the enforcement of the law, meaning, okay, there's, there's voting fraud. There were, there were a bunch of old people who live in a place called the villages by Ocala that, you know, went across the border to Georgia and voted twice. That's blatant fraud. There wasn't an announcement by DeSantis on that. You know, he, he made an announcement to further the stigma of, of the criminal being a criminal. See, they, they, you know, 
Uh, a leopard doesn't change its spots. And, uh, and, and so it's the enforcement of, there is a law that says if something, somebody commits fraud while voting, let's enforce it. But it's the application of this law and the enforcement of this law that's the problem, not necessarily the law itself uh, that I think is what needs to be curbed. Uh, I don't know if Blair or, or Don, you see it differently. I'll, I'll add that the, the federal laws that I'm suggesting that the Justice Department need to enforce are the Help America Vote Act and the National Voter Registration Act. And I think that the those two laws are what mandate that it's the state's job to verify eligibility and that it's it violates federal law for the state to abdicate that responsibility or put the burden of that onto the voter. And I'll just add, you know, I've written about this a little bit in my own reporting, you know, under President Trump, the voting section at the Justice Department was um, very, very quiet. They brought almost no cases, just a handful of cases. And, you know, one of the things I learned in, in writing those stories is, you know, the Justice Department is never going to be the agency that's going to be filing a flurry of cases. You know, they're sort of limited in you know, what they pay attention to, what the laws that they're, you know, trying to enforce. And, you know, they like to uh, bring cases that are sort of slam dunks that they know um, they can win. And, you know, that's not to say, like, like Blair mentioned, that, you know, there isn't more that they can be doing on enforcement, because, you know, when the Justice Department starts paying attention and doing things like sending letters to jurisdictions, sending letters to states, even you know, the, the fact that a state might know that the Justice Department is closely watching them or threatening to bring a lawsuit, you know, might ch cause them to change their behavior um, significantly. So I think you know, even if there aren't lawsuits being filed, there still can be other ways that the Justice Department can wield its enforcement um, power. Um, and with that said, I just wanted to wrap up and I wanted to ask each of our panelists um, just for some closing thoughts on, you know, where they think this movement around um, rights restoration is going, um, what we should be paying attention to when it comes to these um, prosecutions and what if there's things out there that are particularly concerning to them. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So do you want to start with Dawn? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, first of all, I think as a society, we should be outraged that um, so many people are being blocked from participating in our democracy. We should be outraged that we're starting to see these uh, criminalizations more frequently. And I think that as a society, um, as the people of this country, that we together, we have the power to to change it. If we are outraged, as many of us are, we have the power to change it in our um, states and um, to pressure, you know, the federal government to do the right thing. And so um, my hope in changing this is in the people. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing um, change made and people restored. Um, that is our goal. Ray, do you want to go next? Thank you. Uh, applause to you, Don, and the work that you do. Uh, look, uh, Don said it, criminalized. Uh, it, it's still hard for me to fathom that people are going to jail over this nonsense. Um, it's, it's insanity to me. Uh, and, and it's a proven playbook that works, so it'll continue to be used. And that is the focus of National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers will have the honor to work with uh, about creating uh, defense tactics on a nationwide level, because this is coming. These governors get together, and if it's working to suppress and get them elected, they're going to use it. These aren't novel issues. As Blair has pointed out, since the beginning of time, voter suppression has existed, and it targets a specific area of our society. And it's shameful that we still deal with this today. But NACDL's role is to assist anyone that's defending these cases um, 
And, and I just encourage, you know, I, I go to events, I talk about this. Uh, I go to events with other lawyers and I try to get them involved to join organizations like the fine people we have here, because the more I do this, the more respect I have for all these nonprofit organizations that are giving of their time uh, for something that most people, it's not on their radar. Because why? Because they vote. They, they, they go, you know, they're not thinking about this and they need to. Uh, so um, just just know that NACDL is a resource to anyone that's out there uh, that needs help in defending these cases. Uh, and and we're here to help. Thank you for, for including us. Blair, final thoughts? I guess uh, one thing that, that gives me a lot of hope and inspiration in this is working with organizations like Free Hearts and seeing how they've been able to take um, these complicated processes that are designed at disenfranchising their community and turn it into a power building tool. Um, Free Hearts is helping people all across Tennessee with their voting rights, and this is a needed service. So it's a great way to connect with their constituency and build trust and then build power out of that. Um, they now have fellows all across the state. Um, and I love to see that because it actually shows that <laughs> despite the best efforts of some of the powers that be to take away power from this community, that they will actually use that very mechanism to build power and to build build up their support. Um, and I love to see that. And that's that's happening all across the country. And it's a really beautiful thing. And I'll add just what I'm paying attention to is we've seen, you know, many states are starting to create units focused entirely on prosecuting voter fraud. You know, we talked about Florida, but states like Georgia, Arkansas, um, are starting to create similar units. And, you know, we know that voter fraud is extremely rare. That's been proven over and over again. But people with felony convictions, I think for, for someone hunting for voter fraud, these cases represent the lowest hanging fruit. These are people who already are interacting with the government. They already, you know, have a record with the government and it's fairly easy for them to see, for, the, for a government official to look up and see if they've voted. So, you know, as these units are, start hunting for cases to hold up to Trump in his cases of voter fraud, I think that it wouldn't be surprising to me if, if we see more and more people with felony convictions sort of becoming the targets. Um, of these kinds of prosecutions. And I think it's been heartening to see in Florida that, you know, there's been a response um, of really looking into these cases, of questioning whether or not there was the intent um, to vote fraudulently, whether people knew they were ineligible. And I think that those are the kinds of questions to that I'll continue to ask and that um, I think should be continued to ask as more of these cases um, emerge. Um, so with that, thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more questions. Um, but like I said at the beginning, if you have unanswered questions, you can email info at campaignlegalcenter.org. And um, one of us will try and get back to you. But thank you to our amazing panelists. And thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.